Hello and welcome to another how-to video with the Kurzweil K27. In this video, we're having a closer look at Kurzweil's vast architecture by exploring some of the essential features within the sound engine. The main focus for this video is going to be understanding the structure and design of vast algorithms. We'll be having a look at both factory and user algorithms to fully customize your signal flow and get the most out of your programming journey. The main concepts in this video are not only going to apply to the K27, but also many other modern day Kurzweil keyboards using a similar VAST structure. So feel free to follow along and try some of these features out on your own Kurzweil synth. The VAST engine is a system of digital signal processing unique to Kurzweil synths, which lets you fully customize and shape any given sound. This goes from emulating the signal flow of classic analog synthesizer to FM synthesis to even working like a sampler using audio sources. Regardless of what kind of a setup you're working with, FAST allows you to shape the sound by giving you full control over the signal path. Understanding VAST programming starts off with understanding basic signal flow interaction. So let's talk about that for a second. The typical VAST layer within a program, for the most part, would have its starting point at an audio source, known as a key map. A key map is simply a collection of audio samples compiled into a single dataset and stored within the keyboard. These samples can then be assigned to different ranges of the keyboard and play back at different pitches and velocities. From here, the sound signal undergoes various levels of processing through an algorithm. This is going to be found on the algorithm page when you're working in edit mode. An algorithm is simply a chain of DSP units processing the sound in a number of different ways. These DSP units, or DSP blocks, could be waveform oscillators to filters, gain stages, panners, mixers, shapers, and so on. The signal from the key map is then processed by these DSP units and are then modified further using envelopes, effects units, and physical controller assignments for each of these DSP units. Given that each fast layer can have its own algorithm processing, and that each program can have up to 32 layers, the sonic possibilities here truly are limitless. Moving on, fast layers can also be used without a key map, where you can use DSP units in the algorithm as waveform oscillators. In this case, the signal flow would not be sourced from any audio samples, rather being made by one of the DSP blocks within the algorithm. This kind of setup is what we normally call a KVA oscillator. By the way, you also have key maps for these waveforms, like sine waves, saw waves, triangle waves, and so on. But the point to note here is that the waveforms made by KVA oscillators would usually be of a higher quality than using key maps of the same waveforms. So a question there might be when to use waveform key maps and when you want to set up KVA oscillators. And an easy answer to that is choose a waveform key map if you want to be more DSP efficient. And of course, personally, I prefer using KVAs when it comes to classic synth sounds. They're going to be higher quality, have more modulation options, and are in a way easier to work with since they're not playing back any audio samples and are purely made by the DSPs. While this might seem like a whole lot at first, getting into the world of vast programming is easier than it seems, especially after you get a hang of the main pages here. So before we get to the crucial algorithm page, which is the main topic for the video, let's have a quick look at the key map page, just so we're clear about where the signal starts. So I'm going to open up the silent program by typing in 2045. I'm going to press the edit button once, and then go to the key map page. In the key map dialog box, I can scroll or type in the number to find the key map I want to use. Again, this is going to be the audio source for the layer, which is basically a collection of samples assigned to different parts of the keyboard. So I'm going to select one of the piano key maps here as an example. Now I can press the edit button while I'm in the key map dialog box if I want to make edits to this factory key map. On this page, I can make edits to values like tuning, volume, low and high points, velocity and range. Now all of these different pages here are just for the key map settings, which is the way samples are mapped to the keyboard. You can also go a little deeper and make edits to the way the samples are being played back by pressing the edit button while you're in the sample dialog box on the main page. The settings on this page now would be applied to the actual sample itself. So you can choose where the sample starts, where the sample ends, if it's being looped, the volume and pitch values, and so on. Let's go back to the main key map page now. So once you've selected the key map you want to use, you can use some of these basic controls here to set up the key map the way you want. We're probably going to save going into key maps deeper for another video, but for now, since we have a basic idea of what a key map really is, Let's keep moving on. In the case of KVA oscillators, where you have waveform oscillators in the algorithm as the sound source, the 
the layer would use the volume adjustment value and envelope settings of each sample within the key map. That is, even though you'd be hearing the actual sound from the oscillator and not the key map. So if you want to avoid this later and have the oscillator completely unaffected by the key map's volume and envelope settings, you can set the key map on this page to number 999, which is silence. So this way, your KVA oscillator is going to be completely unaffected by the key map. Now, let's go to the algorithm page. On this page, we have a visual of signal flow through the algorithm. So signal goes from left to right here. So we start off with the pitch block, which is the input from the key map, go through all these DSP units here, before ending at the output amp block. Each of these DSP blocks can be of different sizes and thereby different purposes. You can use the arrow keys to move and then use the scrolling alpha wheel or the plus and minus buttons to select what each block is going to be doing. The lines connecting each block almost act like wires connecting different units and this shows you where the signal is being passed. The reason I put it that way is that these blocks can be configured or wired in a number of different ways which means you can manipulate the signal flow itself. So while number one here is fairly simple where sound goes from block one to block two and so on in a linear fashion, you have other more complex ways of routing the signal where you can split the signal, have DSP blocks feed one another and have multiple signal parts all before reaching the output amp. In these cases where you can effectively split the signal path, visually you're going to see multiple wires here showing you where the signal is coming from and where the signal is being sent. For example, take number 24 here. Unlike number 1, where sound was simply going from block 1 to block 2 and so on, you can see all the different ways that the signal is being split and feeding different blocks within the same chain. So in a way, you're cross-patching different DSP units within the same chain. And if you're fairly new to this kind of signal flow, make sure you look at the visuals on the screen carefully. The wires, which are basically these lines here, are going to tell you exactly how the sound is being processed. You can also use the output from another layer within the same program as an alternative input on this page. This can be done using the Alt Input box, and this is called Cascade Mode. Of course, I only have one layer here, but given that you can have 32 of these as a part of your program, Cascade Mode is surely a useful tool to have. You can also make custom algorithms by pressing the Edit button while you're in the Algorithm dialog box. This is where you can make the most out of what we call Dynamic Vast. So as a part of Dynamic Vast, you have full control over what the algorithm is going to look like. The values in the upper half of the screen apply to each of the TSP blocks independently. So the block you're actively editing is going to be highlighted. So you can choose the number of inputs for the block. You can pick the size of the block. By the way, this value is expressed as how many blocks that DSP unit is going to take up. That goes from 1 to 4. You can choose how many outputs you want that block to have. And you can use output mode if you want separate left and right channels. Again, all of these settings apply to each of these boxes independently. So you can use the arrow keys here to navigate to each of these blocks to then set the values the way you want. Beyond that, you can use the same arrow keys to select each of these connective wires between the DSP blocks to split the signal into multiple parts. This way, you can completely change the wiring mechanism. When you're done dialing in your settings, you can save it for easy access. Now for the actual DSP functions you can have, we have quite a large number of options. Usually, if a DSP block is larger in size, it's going to have a more nuanced operation. Also, this means you have more parameters to play with. Take for example a low pass filter. A smaller low pass filter block only offers a cutoff frequency. On the other hand, a two pole low pass block lets you adjust both the frequency and resonance value. So the kind of mod parameters and values you can have for each block fully depends on the size of the block. With KVA oscillators, larger blocks give you access to waveforms like a triple saw. Now most DSP blocks are labeled pretty clearly so you can easily tell what its function is such as oscillators being named after the waveform shape and filters being named after the filter type like low pass and high pass. Some blocks however do need a little more explaining especially if you've never seen it before. For example, 
Waveform oscillators with a plus symbol next to the name, such as sine plus, would usually take up two blocks, and they can add the input signal from the key map to their sound. So here's an example showing you how a sine block is different from a sine plus block. I'll be using a simple piano key map for this example. You also have other waveforms, aptly labeled shaped, which allow you to adjust the shape of the waveform. You can also have a PWM block, which stands for pulse width modulation. This block can produce different waveforms on a spectrum from 1 to 99. By the way, I'm adjusting all of these values for each DSP block on the DSP control and DSP mod pages. Another equally important, but perhaps less intuitive one, is the mix block, which functions just like a simple level mixer to adjust the level of the input signals that are being fed into the mix block. For example, let's have a look at algorithm number 12 here. I'm going to be using the same piano key man, by the way. Now in the first block, I'm going to have a saw wave. Now in the final block, right before the amp, I'm going to select mix. Now we can tell by looking at the wires that the mix block is receiving one signal directly from the key map and another one that's being processed by all the other blocks in a linear fashion. So if I bring up the mix value on the DSP control page, I can bring in the sound of the key map. As I bring the mix level down, I'm only going to hear the signal processed by all the blocks in the algorithm chain, which in this case is going to be the saw wave block. The variant of this is the mix minus block. While the regular mix block works like a blend of two different signals, mix minus is almost like an inverted version where the output is going to be a negative value. Depending on the kind of sound you have, you might see a subtle cancelling out of frequencies. Next, the X fade block. This almost works like a crossfade feature. I can fade between the direct signal and the process signal path. So if I set the X fade value at zero on the DSP control page, I'm only going to hear the key map signal. And as I turn it up and get to 100, I'll start fading towards only hearing the saw wave. So when you see an X in a block's name, the signals from the two input wires are being multiplied. So what this means is the final signal coming out of the mix block consists of both the sums and differences of the frequency content of each signal. So let's have a look at the X gain block. Again, one signal is the key map, which is a piano key map, going directly to the X gain block. And the second one is the saw wave oscillator. Try to pay attention to the kind of harmonic artifacts we hear. The point to remember about X gain is that it's not affected by the amp envelope. And also, since the X block is a multiplication of values, if one of the signals has an amplitude value of 0, the output signal from the block is also going to have an amplitude value of 0. You can also have the plus gain block, which can be used to add gain to the input signal. And of course, the plus block is going to be a sum of the two signals. Now I should mention this, all the parameters and values for each of these blocks can be found on the DSP control page. And if you want to assign physical controllers to these modulation parameters, you'll be using the DSP mod page. The kind of parameters and values you're going to be seeing on these screens depends entirely on the kind of DSP blocks being used. So usually, you're going to see a pitch value for your key map, some fine tuning settings for the pitch, some similar settings for your oscillator waveform, values like cutoff frequency and resonance for your filters, and so on. All the parameters are going to be listed on the left side of the screen, 
and the fine tuning settings and values for each of these parameters is going to be on the right. And you'll be using your arrow keys here to navigate to different dialog boxes and set the values you want. By the way, when you're working on the DSP mod page, an easy way of assigning your physical controllers is to use the intuitive entry feature. So you simply move to the value you want to control, hold enter, and then physically act on the controller you want to assign. There's obviously a lot more to unpack here, especially on these two pages. When you combine these with LFOs, ASRs, and functions, that's when you'll be fully expanding the world of Fast. Hopefully with this video, you've been able to see how we can play around with Kurzweil's signal flow, all made possible by the structure of these algorithms. With the sheer number of possible wiring options, you can basically recreate the exact same signal pattern of any of your favorite classic analog synths, all with the convenience of a more modern approach. And hopefully, you can try some of these features out for yourself. Thank you, and I'll see you next time.